Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 216, I'm thinking so, I think so, I think I'm correct by saying that. 216, dos uno says, welcome back to the show. It is I, Agostino. Um, been a pretty hectic morning today, Um, as I mentioned to you the other day, I'm trying to, I'm working on this other content plan this you know this content plan this week where i'm trying to uh fit in my podcast on days that i'm not working out in the morning so that i can wash out change and get ready to record straight away when i've got my time to myself and stuff and it's been all right so far um this week i'm gonna do three days of running or four days of running i'm gonna run uh, i ran already on monday i ran as well on wednesday which was yesterday and i'm gonna run again tomorrow morning on friday and then hopefully on saturday as well if my body's feeling up for it so those are going to be the main core days but mainly keep it to free and then next week i'm going to ramp up again a little bit more to do monday running tuesday gym wednesday running thursday gym and then friday running and then try and see how that works i just want to kind of mess around my training program and see how my body responds to stuff because you know you have to keep things interesting and you know in general, um, I was thinking about it actually the other day when I was coming back home because I had a bit of a shitty day or something, just you know, just thinking about you know the kind of stuff I want to do and the situation I'm kind of in, being locked into full time employment, just kind of it saps your time. You know, that's one thing I feel about. I feel, <sighs> I think sometimes when you have a job, right? I think you can get some kind of satisfaction. Maybe if you're earning a certain amount, right, it's a wage that maybe allows you to dream and to think of projects you can do allows you to maybe spec out some equipment you want to buy maybe plan a trip that you want to go do some filming on or maybe um invest in something or buy some more stock or whatever right there's there are the jobs you can get that earn you enough money where you can kind of start plotting and plotting your plans for the future but there are also those kind of jobs that you get that you just feel as if they're just taking your time away from you right they're in that weird threshold there's a very strange threshold of, of money that you get paid where it's enough to obviously sustain you and keep you alive and, you know, allow you to do a couple festivals here and there and maybe go to a gig or two or maybe take somebody out for dinner or grab a couple of drinks. Cool. But then there's also um, that thing in the back of your head that's sort of like you're wasting your time, right? Because you get your job done, let's say, by lunchtime or free and you spend the rest of the day pretending to work, which I'm sure everyone else has the same sort of issue for the most part, I think. Most people outside of upper management, because I think, you know, a lot of people kind of have dreams of becoming managers or earning those kind of big bucks, but really that kind of job as well for somebody that, you know, if you're the kind of person that um, nips away to the toilet and sits down for 10 minutes to go on your phone, you're probably not going to be the best manager, right? Because managers are uniquely required to deal with people's bullshit on a day in day out basis right you're essentially a firefighter the entire day you're a psychologist a psychiatrist um and you just basically have to put up with people's stuff right you're their mother you're this you're their father um you're their uncle you're their auntie you're just you're just an emotional support system in general so in in theory that money you're getting on top of it is basically for you to deal with everybody's mental bullshit that they bring into your doorstep which probably is part of the job but again you know you're sacrificing your mental health or your mental um cap or your you know the uh, you're kind of diminishing your mental capabilities by um you know consistently putting yourself in front of people who are then unloading their um hearts and heartaches and troubles and worries onto you on a daily basis which can get a bit overwhelming so sometimes you know you can wish for those kind of things once you get it you're like oh shit so yeah so lately i've been you know i had a couple of things you know had those kind of thoughts where you're like oh man i'm wasting time this happened with my time but as per usual you know with these sort of things I'm, I'm i'm always in two minds i'm always i've always i always kind of feel i feel sometimes um i oftentimes feel quite guilty when i get those kind of feelings because i'm also cognitively aware of how easy it is not to have a job or not to have a source of income that's allowing you to eat sleep and shit so um as much as i can be annoyed by that kind of thing i always have to be internally grateful that the universe or whatever is out there conspiring in my favor is allowing me to have any job whatever it pays whatever it does right in order for me to sustain myself and those around me so i'm thankful for it yeah really i'm thankful for it but um one of the things that really helps me to kind of keep myself grounded and stop being so like you know um you know just annoyed by the whole situation is to work out and if you're wondering why I kind of work out like a freak or why I do these weird, crazy things, like trying to read a book a week or trying to just push myself as much as I can physically and mentally, it's because those are the things that actually keep me 
um, from going insane, right, from dealing with this kind of nine to five drudgery that I kind of have to go through day in, day out. And um, it can be annoying, right? But those things really do help to counterbalance it. Because if I don't have it, I start to get into my head. I start to think about, you know, oh, shit. How come, you know, I have so many um, interests or hobbies that I'm obviously into, um, one or two talents here and there, but I can't seem to figure out a way out of this nine to five grind, right? I can't figure out a way. And, you know, um, at the age I am at now and with the people around me who have also done similar things or done, you know, less than the things that I'm trying to do in their own kind of way. I'm just, you just sit there thinking, fuck man, what, what is it me? Am I just not that bright enough? Or am I just, am I just not that bright? Am I not that? Cause just getting some really brutal, cause, um, brutal analysis. Cause it, it, happen, it happens a lot in sport, right? I think in football, I, I got conspired against a lot when I used to play Sunday league football, right? I got like, you know, I, I had to deal with some fucking shitty managers, but ultimately, you know, it's no stretch to say that maybe I just wasn't good enough for the football team that I was playing for, right? So I got I got subbed, and then eventually you lose interest because you're little, you know you want to play football, so you don't you stop playing, right? You might develop over 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 some years. I'm I'm probably better than a lot of people, I, I assume, because you know I come from an area where there's a high concentration of really good football players. So I'm probably not as good as everyone else around me, but I'm better than most people in the country, right? It's that kind of law of average. All right, no problem. But at least with sports, you get told quite quickly, or you get some feedback. You have a feedback loop that kind of tells you, okay, cool, maybe you're not as good as you think you are, no problem. But in life, you don't really get that feedback loop that doesn't exist, right? Because some people don't make it because of their obvious talent. Some people don't make it because of their hard work. Some people just make it through pure convenience, right? Um, for instance, if you're a photographer in a small town or taking part in a small scene and you take all the photographs for the culture, right? The scene that you're in, going to nightclubs, you go to gigs, you go to exhibitions, whatever it may be. If you happen to be the first crop of people doing it, there'll be, you know, there'll be the same kind of lot of people putting the same photos out and it'll get a bit boring, right? But then I'll, I'll, what, there, will, there will come a time, I think Gary V mentioned it the other day actually about um, uh, Black Panther, right? About this, his idea that he's fascinated, I think the Auburn Marcus podcast, he mentioned it recently, that he's fascinated with the idea about this person who was obsessed with Black Panther, didn't think there was anything money in it, but just kept going with Black Panther thing, you know, was protecting the magazines, um, clipping up clips of old videos on youtube and uploading onto instagram just you know obsessed with it and built a little community of like four thousand people the moment black panther the movie comes out marvel are gonna hit you up brand sponsors are hitting you up people are hitting you up so they can kind of um sponsor you or get you to blast out the film on your feed right so suddenly you've gone from being this really tiny voice of a tiny scene into now being um a tiny voice of a big scene right or the big voice of a big scene or whatever it may be called right and um I think success is kind of like that, especially outside of sports. Some people just make it because other people just stop doing what they were doing. So the photographer, for example, right? Some club photographer just stop doing it and they just, you know, they move on to other things. They get family, they get a full-time job or they stop, you know, um, taking drink tokens or 100 quid a night isn't enough for them. Hey! Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. So they head off, right? And I'm fascinated with the idea that there's some club photographers that just that just never stopped, right? And now they are, you know, being flown around to Paris Fashion Weeks and to Design Weeks and to film premieres. All this was all unlucky, all because they just decided not to stop. And part of success is 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 like that, right? So for someone like me who hasn't necessarily hit the heady heights I want to hit, I can sometimes have a false sense of where I am in that journey because. I look around and I see some people that have made it, you know, purely based on their talent. Some people have made it purely based uh, um, based on their talent and their network. Some people made it just from grinding. And other people just made it because they just stuck around long enough to just go through the shitness, right? To kind of eat shit as much as possible and just hang around the longest, right? They had the resilience and they were basically effectively the last man standing, right? And then, or last man, last woman. And there, and here they are presenting all opportunities in the world because there's no one else are available. And then all suddenly you get to kind of like suddenly out of that you get to kind of carve your own lane, and you basically get to have a job for life, right? You only have to look at somebody like a Fraser Cook at Nike is a kind of a good example. Of course, somebody with a great knowledge base, with great contacts, whatever it may be. But in this era, you know, there's you know, I think for the most part, anyone into shoes or clothing is sort of like their own Fraser Cook. Maybe not with the same level of knowledge or expertise or depth, but essentially, it would have been harder for him to have made it in that profession of being that you know the solo Nike energy marketing guy, kind of beating on the sound of his own drum. It would have been so it would been harder for him to do it nowadays than it would have been back then because it wasn't that many people doing it. Especially an English dude who spoke Japanese, who I think has an Asian wife, who you know what I mean, like assimilating that kind of culture. It just made sense that he would be 
be the one to kind of you know carve his own lane and essentially you know it's a job that they can't really rehire for nowadays really there might be a couple of expats around but for a level of knowledge and contact he has it's sort of like a one-off job and unfortunately you know um hopefully the knowledge will be passed on you know when he decides to move on or whatever it may be but yeah that's kind of where i've been thinking but again the working out and the doing this podcast and stuff really just helps me kind of get out of my mind with that because again like i'm like just hearing myself speak about it is a bit nonsensical because you know i can't control any of these things they're not within my control what i can control is putting out good content is um, pursuing my djing is you know writing as much as i can is reading and expanding my vocabulary and the way that i think um and is just continually trying to be creative and trying to make cool things and go from there really isn't it that's all i can do right i can't do anything else but that um talking about cool things the other video yesterday was annoying because I, I recorded it and i couldn't some of the screen um flips didn't work so i'm going to try and make sure that these it works this time around because i want to make sure you guys see what i'm seeing when i'm talking about said things so let's just jump right into it right as that um guy says on youtube sometimes what 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 so first things first lol at nike i'm sure some of you guys have seen it a very interesting story has developed over the last few weeks also over the last few days which has kind of got the whole sneaker community aghast aghast right again not that big of an issue i think um there are occasions in life where sometimes an apology is warranted but there are also occasions in life where you start to wonder Again, just because I have knowledge of the inside, having been inside these buildings, having seen how they kind of act and go on, it's just interesting to see how these things happen. And it just makes me laugh and chuckle on the inside. So this story is from NPR. It's been all over the, the social media anyway. And it's concerning one Nike. Nike uh, decided to pull a shoe from featuring, because it featured a Betty DeVos flag over concerns about racist symbolism, right? So it's so a Nike and Max are meant to come out um, soon. I think for Black History Month, I'm assuming so. And they had um, this flag on on the back of the hill that supposedly is uh, has been co-opted by um, white supremacists, right? Um, supposedly, um, Colin Kaepernick was the one that kind of put in a call to Nike for him to pull it. But let's read the story and I can laugh as we go along. <laughs> um, here it is. Ba, ba, ba. Nike has recorded a shoe featuring Betty, uh, Betsy, the, Betsy Ross flag over concerns that the design glorifies slavery and racism. The red and white blue sneaker had been set to hit the US market's commemorated July 4th holiday. Oh, shit, okay, it's a 4th of July shoe. Nike has chosen not to release the Nike Air 1 Quick Strike 4th of July as it features an old version of an American flag, the company told NPR on Tuesday. Nike did not immediately respond to questions about the thinking behind the original design. It released a statement saying, We're regularly, We regularly make business decisions to withdraw initiatives, products, and services. Nike made a decision to halt distribution of the shoe based on concerns that it could unintentionally offend and distract from the uh, nation's patriotic culture. Holiday. The special Air Max One design, which includes an embroidery of a famous flag featuring the 13 stars and original 13 colonies, <laughs> drew complaints that it celebrates <laughs> uh, an era of US history when slavery was legal and commonplace. While the flag's defenders say it has a place in history, critics say it has become a symbol of extreme views. It's, it's, it's funny that they would have a flag of slavery on the back of Air Max Ones, right? That are essentially, you know on the back of a shoe that gets reissued a million times, on the back of a quick strike release that is tied and drawn out, on the back of this um this fucking drive to rinse all the money out of sneakerheads without listening to anything they say, you would call that modern slavery in some way, shape or form. I'm sure there's a good Kanye West song that we can overlay over this that will kind of make some sense. Um... These, uh, those critical of Nike issue include activists and former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick. According to Wall Street Journal, YouTuber says Colin Kaepernick asked Nike to reconsider the design out of concern it would send a wrong message about the race, about race in the modern United States. Kaepernick has not commented publicly about the controversy. However, the No Your Rights campaign find about Kaepernick's retweet several messages about Nike's decision, including one that used the Twitter hashtag I'm with Cap, echoing the protest that made um, Kaepernick famous. Nike's pre-released images of the shoe sparked commentary and debate last week. I wasn't free yet. Read one comment sticking his Instagram. Uh, and obviously, air slavery. <laughs> Nike's sudden decision to withdraw the shoe drew an even bigger response. It's a good thing Nike only wants to sell sneakers to people who hate America, Ted Cruz said, wrote in response to general... What does that even make? What's Ted Cruz talking about? Ted Cruz is, is opposed to Nike pulling the shoe. Why? Because it's an American flag, right? He doesn't see any. That's a, that's the issue with politics in nowadays, right? There's two extreme reactions. There's the reaction on the left of like burn the shoe, pull it, burn down everything that Nike's ever stand for. Nike is cancelled, right? 
and then there's a right where it's like there's nothing wrong that you guys are overreacting there's obviously a middle ground there's obviously some emotional attachment people have towards or response they have towards that flag right does uh, maybe um bring back some memories and you're also right uh, people on the right to be like you know hey this is part of our history we shouldn't tear down you know the whole tearing down the statues and all that stuff i'm not really sure that i'm really with it i think again it's part of our history it's something that we should be able to confront or just discuss in an adult manner but nowadays we don't really have adult conversations unfortunately they all kind of devoid into kind of like kids squabbling on the playground um but if we could have an adult conversation about it it'd be a much more constructive adult conversation to have maybe they get put in maybe those statues get put in museums or whatever it may be called right um um right or some but tearing them down and shit is a bit strange um because who's to say that some of the statues that we see in um you know uh the roman times that have, have their faces you know smashed off might not have been a protest as well to something they have they might have done during you know uh during those times right imagine somebody was you know accused of murdering someone and they happen to have a statue of them maybe they the, a mark of disrespect or a mark that you'd been ostracized by your community was to maybe kind of smash your face off of your statue that could be a, that could have been a thing i'm not you know i'm not opposed to that but again let's have an interesting conversation about it as opposed to just like you know occupying both ends of the fringe but again um the article continues here by the time Nike decided to pull the shoes, though, the company had already shipped the sneakers to retailers to meet the July first date. The controversy initially went sent the shoe into collectible territory, where the original suggested price was one forty. The sneaker at one point was selling for two thousand five hundred on clothing site StockX. As the sneaker magazine kept to note, the shoe has been pulled from Nike's new launch site. Nike's about face drew a sharp rebuke from Arizona government uh, Doug Ducey, who announced that his state will no longer offer tax incentives to Nike to try and lure the company to incent. If so i guess they lose now on that right we don't stuck up okay the, the, the historic flag base design was codified in 1777 when the continental congress adopted a resolution calling for a national flag comprising of 13 stars to 13 stars white red and blue presenting a new constellation in recent years right wing and extremist groups have attempted to adopt a betsy ross flag in 2016 supporters of the then called donald trump displayed it alongside make america great again banners at a high school basketball game football game leading a michigan superintendent to apologize to anyone who was offended jesus christ um despite the flags in name betsy ross rowan designed the creating the flag according to is largely fictionist explaining to the, 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 the okay so we've got a flag here that essentially um causes a reaction with a, a certain amount of people in the u.s um, specifically people um, of an african-american heritage who obviously you know have natural reservations towards it makes complete sense nike in their infinite wisdom decide that they will put that flag on the back of an air max one on the back of sneakers that are predominantly something worn by again um marginalized people i guess people of color have made basically sneaker culture a thing um it's funny right for me it's funny because having worked for nike in the past in some capacity as an independent contractor not as an official employee when i used to work at 1948 and having seen how some of the people that work there go on having seen how hard it was for some of my friends myself included to get a full-time job working at nike it makes me laugh because again i think the same happens at probably places like apple and stuff right the the more prestigious the brand um the more appeal it has the more it also has um the tendency to employ a few wankers here and there right people who um take their job a little bit too seriously or people who feel as if they are mark parker themselves or if they are tinker hatfield right people that are on the lowest rungs who kind of elevate themselves to a point where they kind of feel as like they have the they have the shot calling and privileges which they might do right they might have it might be a culture at nike again i hadn't chance i didn't have a chance to ever work there but there might be a culture at nike where some of the people that are the lower rungs get to dictate who actually comes in through the door right but there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of scarcity in that um concept in that kind of employee workplace right everyone's afraid of letting anyone else in because they know by and large the job that they're doing is bullshit and most people that have an interest in shoes in culture in fashion in the scene in streetwear could do their job with their eyes closed right superbly easily uh, without no hassle so they have to there has to be a level of protecting protecting their space in some regard which i'm respectful for and i don't have any problems with at all it's just interesting and funny to me that in a building or in a place full of so many different people for so many different colors and creeds who are more worried about their job than they are worried about doing the right thing or representing the culture in the right way or doing the best thing 
in the interest of the people that buy the shoes, i.e. sneakerheads, i.e. streetwear people, right? In the interest of just keeping their job, they'll keep their mouth shut and just go along with whatever's happening. Because you know for sure, there was someone in the room that did see that and thought, hey, that's a bit, that's a bit dodge, that's a bit questionable or whatever, but they'll probably explain, the, it's probably rationalized to them in some sort of clever, it's a bitsy slideshow way, right? They probably was able, they were, they were trying to maybe take, reclaim the flag, take it back, work malarkey. They did whatever they could to kind of make it make sense, but... I'm sure there's people in the room that didn't think it was a good idea. But guess what? They carried on doing anyway. And it's funny because these same people that are so stringent with who they let in, they won't hire you because you don't know certain people, you, you didn't suck that person's dick, or you're not friends with that person, or you didn't go to that event. Suddenly, these are the same people who now got themselves into hot water, right? The people that made such a big fuss out of backing Colin Kaepernick, right? Um, for doing what he was doing, where he stood by, he, he, you know, his moral compass, whether you agreed it or not agreed, it cost him his livelihood, right? He took a big gamble and he made such a big deal out of it that now look at them right now they're the same person who they backed and said you know we're going to support you politically uh and sociology and with you know with your social justice issues are now in hot water and this same person is now having to kind of essentially you know um smack you on the wrist and shit it's just like it's just it, you couldn't make this up you really couldn't make this up it's such a faux pas in the biggest sense of the word again like i said because they've got a huge community of artists designers collaborators around them who are just again for me i'm not bothered i don't give a shit about this sort of stuff i think it can get you know apologized away quite quickly but nowadays with how oversensitive people are with how there are some people out there who are just looking to get offended with the recent thing that happened recently with the air force one um Remember the race they put out recently about um, what was that? Was it the American Indian um, sort of like pattern that got pulled from the line again? They already had a misstep, right? That they, they should have maybe, oh, actually, whoa, and that was a misstep that didn't really make any sense to me at the time. But again, people from that American Indian society were very offended by it. Okay, cool. Let's agree with what they say. Let's pull the product. And then they do this again back to back. It's just like some of these brands have absolutely no idea, no clue whatsoever, no clue. But they like to pretend like they do. They like to give the assumption that they know what they're going, that know what they're doing. The people working, they like to pretend as if they are experts of their field, but they're not. So again, it goes back to show that um, for all you sneakers out there who are, you know, again, who um, kiss the ground Nike walk on or other, all these other sneaker brands, just know that there are human beings behind them, just like in anywhere else in the world, right? It's not just this faceless brand. There are humans I work there, and humans are susceptible to making mistakes. They're susceptible to making the wrong decisions, making the wrong calls, or just doing stupid things or protecting their job over doing the right thing for the community or the people that they're quote unquote trying to serve um and these things are always going to happen the best thing that you can do to inoculate yourself from this is not buy into the hype it's a quick strike who gives a shit leave it where it may be but again this hype market that they've created look look at the unintended consequences the shoe is now reselling for i don't know 10 times its value that's that that is what you get right for your nonsense right you play around with the with the reselling market and it's eventually essentially you make a shoe that people deem as racist and is now selling for 10 times its worth you could not make this up really it's just insane the level of stupidity that goes in something like that it's just like especially again especially nowadays for anyone else it wouldn't matter any other era no era it wouldn't matter in world history it would not matter but nowadays to not be cognitively aware of what's going on and to put this out still just makes me laugh and just again for all the people out there that work there that try and go on as if they're billy big bulls you know there you go man there you go where were you when this was meeting was taking place where were you now you're going to be gossiping around the water cooler at work try and pretend like you always knew this was a bad idea fuck out of here man like people man sometimes employees are the worst bro honestly and again they're the worst because i'd say if you if i'm a manager of at nike i've got a million and one things to do right area manager general manager i'm flying around the world i'm selling shoes i'm balancing budget sheets i've got so much stuff to do i rely on my subordinates right the the people working at mid to lower level right i rely on them to kind of feedback to me hey i'm on i'm on black twitter hey i'm on the internet hey i'm on social media hey i'm plugged in this shoe isn't cool they should be able to say that but those people are the ones that are so worried about their job that they'll deny people like i or people like you or people like anyone else out there who wants to have a job there and do a great work and you know um it has a couple of projects in mind they'll deny you a job by not letting you in or by closing the door and making sure you don't get through but then they will protect their job at all costs and not even speak up when need to be and then guess what happens then who gets the blame the person at the top the person below doesn't get any blame because they can just hide or cower behind a pillar somewhere and pretend as if they weren't in or you know as if that you know they got 
you know, over overran or something. It's just it's just insane. It's insane. It's insane. But hey, what can you do? I'm not surprised. Um, big brands with you know, big brands pretending to be plugged in, into culture, um, stumbling and making cultural mistakes. Name me a better duo. Um, let's move on. Studio Neat Minimus Design. Awesome. So I, I stumbled upon this studio called Studio Neat. Uh, specifically because I've been listening to or I've just finished uh, the book that I read just recently now on um, Apple Books. Which I recommend you check out. It's a lot. Would I dare say Apple Books is better to use than Audible? I know it's flattering to say that because I used to have them as a sponsor back in the day. But um, I'm, I'm liking the audio, the uh, the Apple Books experience so far. It's been pretty good to use. So I finished reading um this book called Where's my library here? Uh, the Company of One, right? I finished reading this book called The Company of One. Um, this book right here, right? Because you can see it on the screen. Hopefully, I hope you guys can see that it's right there, right? Uh, by Paul Jarvis, an amazing book that essentially kind of expounds upon some of the ideas you might have heard in the Four Hour Work Week. It's basically a book talking about, you know, um. The move to the move away from uh, building startups or small businesses to scale, right? I know um, every startup I've worked for so far in the last few years has always kind of bragged about the amount of employ new employees they're hiring, the amount of new investment they're taking on, the amount of uh, regions they're opening up, and that's been a kind of a mark of like your so your brand is growing, right? Because essentially, when you start a business or you start a startup, you essentially start it in order to fill a need, right? There's a need in the market that people have are aware of or not aware of. You service it you build it and obviously the more that you're obviously growing as a company is kind of a indication of how much people actually want your item right or want your product or your service so that's been kind of a thing but over the years lately we've seen a lot of pulling back a lot of resistance to splitting in a camp or some people saying you know what you don't need to build your business to be multi-billion dollar not everyone needs to be facebook or instagram or google because you know we know what troubles that leads to and in general sometimes running small businesses um, it lends itself to having a small team, sometimes a remote team, sometimes a team distributed all over the world that can work uh, in a very specific and specialized way, maybe with no distractions too, and can put out the best products. Essentially, that's what it's all about. First, you've got an internet connection, you've got a phone, you can essentially connect with the entire world. So you don't need to have you know everyone housed in one building. So um, what Paul Jarvis argues is that you should be building a company of one that's essentially something you can be building during your work, right? During your work career or your nine to five, like I'm doing at the moment. That could essentially then start scaling up a little bit in terms of the amount of output or the amount of work you're doing, the amount you're charging, which essentially allow you to leave your full time work and kind of take up arms and become a sort of like company of one, which is less Less so than a freelancer, because freelance obviously have jumped from project to project, but more so as in having recurring uh, punters or recurring customers coming back to you uh, for, particular, for a particular product or service that you're supplying. And one case study that he kind of um, um, highlighted was these uh, two friends uh, who started up a design studio called Studio Neat, which I'm going to get up here on the screen. And again, I haven't heard of them previously, but it's a pretty cool concept. And essentially, um, the founder spoke about a little bit on the podcast of the company one in the book about um you know his dread of hiring people was that he didn't want to ever have that conversation where he had to let go of somebody right and because he knew how much he used to count or rely on a wage when he used to work a nine to five so the idea of having to hire somebody and then having to let them go if they weren't good enough and then you know the kind of turmoil and struggle that comes with not having a source of income he didn't want to ever be part of that right and that was what kind of drove him which is something you don't really hear too often right sometimes you always hear of the solo entrepreneur of the team of entrepreneurs who are like oh i used to sell lemonade and lemonade stand i used to sell um baseball cards i used to go in the street market i used to do whatever i used to hustle chewing gum you know there's always that kind of you know that rags riches story that everyone has but you never really hear people say i literally started a business because i didn't ever want to be fired again right or i didn't ever want to fire somebody again right which is or some ever in general General. you don't really hear that so it's cool to hear that kind of perspective but anyway so studio neat um make cool products essentially um individual products that they sell on their on their site um really well made um minimalist kind of design they have everything from uh a mark one which is a minimal and durable retractable pen they have a tote book a notebook you can take with you they have a material dock wood docks for your apple stuff you can just lay on top of it which is interesting um i did realize that the other day i was thinking about how i think because i was listening again these are two things happening at the same time right i was reading company of one i was also listening to um what audiobook i listened to other one i've got here so i was listening to company of one 
I'll listen to something else. I'm listening to what's that book by Cal Newport? Oh, uh, I was listening to Digital Minimalism, Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport too, which I finished as well, right? So I'm listening to these two podcasts at the same time, right? At the same damn time. So these two books at the same damn time. And I've got these two conflicting things in my head. I've got this idea that, you know, you start this solo business on your own company of one, that you can kind of scale and essentially build into a lifestyle business that essentially supports your lifestyle and doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, a, a, a 1.5 million gross um, whatever business or maybe whatever those numbers people like to throw out but it also got me thinking about digital minimalism right by cal newport the book in terms of you know re- retracting from social media not being continually plugged in and kind of stepping away from the plug that is social media right and then it got me looking at how people react or enact or act or interact with social media in general and it got me thinking about people that just put their phone down on tables when they're talking it's a very weird move, isn't it, right? To be talking to somebody in real life and have your phone down on a table because essentially any notification that pops up, you look at it. And if you, have you noticed any times, have you ever noticed in conversation with people, just look, watch people talking on tables. When someone else puts their phone down on the table face, facing up, someone else will do the same thing, right? And then when their phone pops up with a notification, they'll look and then instinctively the other person will look at their phone too. It's just a natural reaction people seem, seem to have all the time. Sort of like when you yawn and if the other person sees you, it's contagious and they sort of yawn as well. And it got me thinking just about how, you know, glued we are to our phones. That in a conversation with your friend, you have to put it on the table. It's a weird thing because you don't need to really. I guess people maybe do it because... Um, they don't want to have their phone in their pocket and it kind of hurts when they sit, especially if you're wearing, nowadays everyone wears slimmer or skinny jeans into some way, shape or form. So maybe it kind of clasping on your leg is kind of annoying. And maybe if you've got big legs like I have or long legs, you, your, your thighs may be touching the underside of the table. So that might be annoying. But interesting, um, just interesting how that is. And I guess Studio Neat have kind of built upon that because they've got um, this thing, which is a material doc, which I've never heard of, uh, a little kind of circle. If you listen to the podcast, it's a little circular round wooden thing with a, a nice granite. It looks like kind of top where you can kind of rest all your gadget on top of, which looks really cool, I guess, for the most part, if you're that way inclined. They've also got a glyph, a clamp that holds your iPhone. You can put on a tripod. They've got a canopy, which is a keyboard case, an iPad stand a pano book they've got a cosano a, a, essentially a, gra- a graphite um pencil oh no it's a stylus okay it looks like a graphite gra- pencil that's awesome i used to use that back in the day man in school for art that used to be one that used to be my jam man there's no way you can not draw well using a gra- a granite stick like honestly sketching on a granite stick is fucking awesome i love it an apple tv remote stand they've got a neat ice pick so basically loads of little cool interesting products and again something that i've kind of thought to do myself um as well uh kind of taking inspiration from um, hiroshi fujiwara and his seminal book um what's that o- objects and things whatever it's called where is it it's here somewhere no, I've got it. nowhere near but anyway hiroshi fujiwara has this amazing book one of my you know idols in uh streetwear and fashion in general he has this girl this is the book he has this great book that kind of speaks about you know that kind of highlights some of his own worldly possessions and, you know, him coming from the fragment school of design or him having his own, frag, you know, studio that he kind of works out of. I kind of thought it would be a great way to do collaborations if I ever got to that kind of level with brands where you can kind of detach yourself away from it, which is sort of like what I thought, which I think is what um is maybe Virgil's long-term goal with Louis Vuitton. Because I think a lot of people were saying that even before he got the Louis Vuitton job, that he was always kind of kind of auditioning for the role anyway, right? Um he wanted a he wanted a role similar because he saw the long term vision was to always have off white and sort of like this design studio that could kind of exist by itself, right? It might I wouldn't be surprised if studio if off white got to a point where he was not even the person in front of it anymore or the kind of quote unquote creative director where it got to a point where it was kind of you know um, ambiguous as to who was designing it. The designs were changing season to season now, different themes, different flows, different patterns, different shapes, different colors. Um, and again, he could then concentrate um, lending his name to different houses and kind of imprinting his DNA, um, you know, within what they do in general. And I think that's a good way to kind of look at things, right? So I think with Hiroshi Fujiwara, with Fragment, that's what acts as that sort of like the umbrella for all these projects so that he can then lend his name, if he wants, directly to shoes, which he's done sometimes with Nike. And he could also na- lend his design studio uh, moniker, the two Thunderbolts, to some things that he does as well, which he's done as well with Nike. And this book called uh, Personal Effects kind of details a lot of his own possessions that he has in his collection. And most of it, if not all, a kind of a good portion of it, is his own stuff that he's done collaborations with, right? Stuff like this, like... um 
these uh these shoes that he brought back right um the nike air zoom all court premium leather and again th- this is the kind of level that you need to be on i think for all our streetwear friends enthusiasts that might be out there right this is what you need to do this is my vision or goal of what i want to do anyway essentially like this is what it means to be a sneakhead or to be someone who's involved in the culture it's, it's not a, the model isn't something a lot of people are kind of bothered about it's a nike all court um I remember when I used to work at 948, these were available for a very long time. Only a specific type of person was even coming out to buy them. But again, get an opportunity to work with Nike. So they're going for the easy, um, low-hanging fruit. He picks out a model that a lot of people are wearing and brings them back in very um, subtle way. Uh, all black upper, all white, um, all white sole, no foxing at all. Just really well done. Clever use of materials. Just a clever, great shoe. And... That's something I'd love to do. And I think the company one book kind of expounds on the idea of how to particularly kind of iterate that kind of thing out. And this book is awesome too, because it's got even, it's even got like stuff about his pens and shit that he's designed, right? Or pens he's collected, like this Mont Blanc pen he's collected. And this is, again, we're not really seeing that much of it nowadays with the influencers, right? We're seeing a lot of influencers who dress really well. We're seeing a lot of influencers who can, who maybe are good at producing the odd, you know, the odd graphic tee, again, which is not easy to do, so don't ever discourage that. Doing good, doing a good, making a good graphic t-shirt is very difficult. Um, again, we've got Afa that he helped kind of take part in as well. But, we, but we're not really seeing a resurgence of the influencers in the, of the scale of an Aaron, not influencer, but, you know, the cultural movers and shakers, the cultural, um, you know, mainstays, like an Aaron Bondorov. We're not really seeing a new iteration of that so far, but we've not seen a new resurgence. We've not seen the new version of those kind of people. The, the ones that kind of carried on the Andy Warhol lineage. Maybe the closest thing we've got to is maybe a Virgil. Uh, but again, I think he divides opinion too much for people to actually say that he is one of those people, right? I don't think people credit him with that much of an original thought on idea outside maybe these shoes, which again is sad, but I think he might have kind of damaged his name um, permanently because of the stuff he did with Pyrex especially those flannels and shit. I think that is maybe the reason why people don't really give them enough credit. But yeah, um, I don't know, man. I, I, I was reading that, that book, Company of One. I recommend you check it out. It's a really interesting book. It kind of got me thinking about stuff that I want to do. And it got me thinking as well. And, it, and it, again, highlight this amazing design studio, Studio Neat, that I recommend you check out. They make cool, amazing things. I'm, I'm definitely thinking of doing something similar with my own design projects, especially with like those kind of one or one of things that you want to make that aren't just merged things, right? You want to kind of put in an umbrella because this is similar to what um, Tom Sachs does at his studio, right? Tom Sachs has got his own studio that he kind of works on and does the same sort of thing. Where is it? Tom Sachs, right? It's similar sort of project that Tom Sachs does at his shop, I'm pretty sure. So essentially, he kind of has all these, and I think Heron Press did the same sort of thing. He had an object company, I think, or whatever, something similar that he kind of housed all these projects in. And I guess, as you can see on the screen here, Tom Sachs, the a contemporary artist who also has a studio based out of New York. No, that's a studio based out of New York. Does something similar too. He has here on the screen um, everything from a fanny pack to a zine uh, to a t-shirt to chairs to playing cards or playing card holders. Another chair, zine, 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 zines. Again, great stuff all around. Um, an entire store full of little trinkets that he makes or his team in the studio are able to design and put out there. Um, so yeah, um, I'm. I think I'm going to do something similar to it. I need to make more creative projects apart from this podcast. There needs to be more output for me in general. But yeah, that's a that's an amazing book. I recommend you check out um, Company of One uh, by Paul Jarvis. Again, very inspirational book. Got me thinking about loads of things, as you can tell. Uh, next on the list here, we have um, Ooh, San Francisco uh, techies are hate San Fran too, right? Um, or Silicon Valley people? I guess San, well, Silicon Valley is in San Fran, right? Um, I've heard of this story a couple of times. I think I've seen it highlighted maybe where? Um, where else in the highlight? I think this came as a consequence of the conversation. You remember when um, Trump quite brilliantly said, it was like, as a fun, a, quite a funny comment, like a retort to, you know, a lot of the conversations around immigration, sort of, sort of along the lines of all. Um, if the left are so you know keen on welcoming immigrants to this country why not we build sanctuary towns or whatever space or safe spaces where you know immigrants could go and migrate to with no uh, fear of ice agents coming and deporting them in some of these kind of legacy cities san fran all the places that are kind of left-leaning or mostly democrat and you know it didn't really get much response from the left but i kind of thought it was quite funny at the time right and it kind of got me thinking about some of the comments a lot of people have said about, you know, the fact that some of these tech companies think they can sort the ills of the world. They think they know more 
or they know more than the general population or they think they have their finger on the pulse because of all the data sets they're able to kind of get in for people's um, decision making processes during the day you know they have a bit of a, a god complex towards them but the example that they kind of lean on is, is like oh they don't they, they, they have no idea how to actually govern or how to actually maintain spaces or to you know in order in any way shape or form in san francisco right because they have really bad problem with homelessness um there's a lot of there's a big problem with housing there it's very expensive to get any apartments uh, people are having to share rooms and live in fucking cupboards and shit it's just a, a really bad place to be so i think it's just something along the lines of like the social experiment has failed because san francisco has failed because most of the startups are based there but san fran is a bit of a dysfunctional city and this article from um guardian kind of expounds on that and says the following we all suffer why san francisco techies hate the city they, they transformed it's a little article from a writer called julie carry wong it says the following it was a beautiful winter day in san francisco and zoe was grooving uh to the soundtrack of the roller skating musical zandu as she rode in the east Coast to work 29 year old tech worker who had had just passed the uber building when without warning the homeless man jumped into the back lane with his dog blocking a path she slammed on the brakes flew four feet into the air and landed on the pavement bleeding it was one of one of those hardening moments where i was like even i'm being affected right so she was again that's an example of just how weird of a place san fran is right this young millennial uh working at an amazing tech startup in U in uber is riding her electric scooter to work on a designated bike lane and some homeless guy jumps out in on there with his dog in hand and makes her fly four feet in the air right it's just a an exact kind of a good kind of contrast to just how crazy it's got in san fran it, it should be noted that Zoe, who asked not to be identified by her real name because she was not authorized by a employee to speak to the press, is not the stereotypical tech worker bro who moves to San Francisco for a job immediately starts complaining about the city's dire homelessness crisis. She arrived in 2007 to study at San Fran State University and had a career in arts before attending a coding boot camp and landing a job at a major tech company. But the four and other instance, incidences included getting mugged and having her phone stolen have all contributed to her growing sense of insecurity in the era she told the guardian uh the tale of her scoot interrupted because she said it was a perfect example of her own and perhaps broader community of tech workers increasingly hate hate relationship with san francisco this guy needed services to help him she said at the man who caused a fall and we all suffer because of the issues that are not being addressed which is true right so all the tech startups are located there because it's become this, you know, utopia where a lot of, a lot of these amazing stories about tech startups being invested in because of a guy sitting in a coffee shop that looked scraggly and some investor walks up to him and gives him a lot of cash, which isn't true, or about people overhearing the beginnings of a certain startup starting, which probably isn't true either. Loads of great stories have kind of stemmed from there. And, you know, again, it's the breeding ground and the home of a lot of the startups we know and love. So everyone kind of goes there. And again, even nowadays with decentralized um, communication, will people be able to live wherever they want around the world with the proliferation of the internet and whatever it may be and communication protocols people are still still infatuated with kind of living in this one particular area which is interesting because i wonder if that same thing happens in the uk with kids living in dawson i wonder if there's still again i don't talk to kids that young but i wonder if kids under the age of 25 are still infatuated with coming to east london and living in dawson um or living in peckham or new cross or these kind of hotbed cities where all the hipsters kind of um go because I, I think for me when I was growing up, that was a, an important part of my process, right? I had to go in order to kind of kind of cut my teeth on the scene, figure out what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. That was part of the process. So I think people might probably to do the same thing now. I assume so, right? I don't think these things change. I think they just kind of continue along the same sort of route. And then eventually people kind of disseminate and start to do other things. But hopefully the home of... Because we got, we got a similar here in London. We've got that Silicon Roundabout in Old Street. You know, that kind of area from, I don't know, the Argos in Old Street all the way to, I'd say, maybe Curtin Road in Shoreditch is predominantly made up of startups or smaller businesses that pretend to be startups or businesses that are large that pretend to put their office have a satellite office quote unquote in a startup work is co-working space there's a few we works around there too um but yeah london is not really like that because i think people just have to go where the space is there's not much space in london so you can't really be a tech startup area because you know there won't be that many units to rent but anyway i digress uh, a quarter of a century after the first dot-com bubble the battle of san francisco's soul is over and the tech industry has won but what happens when the victories when the victors realize that they don't particularly like the spoils tech workers are increasingly vocal about their disconnect with the city they fought so hard to conquer in may in may the median market rent for a one bedroom apartment reached an all-time high three thousand seven hundred seven hundred dollars a month 
three thousand and seven hundred dollars a month for a one-bedroom apartment oh my god according to rental site zampa meanwhile the city saw a 17 percent increase in its homeless population again abhorrent between 2017 and 2019 um that's what didn't someone say that i forgot who said that like all these tech all these techies are more worried about building the next i think that was when um um those games are making people billionaires and millionaires multi-millionaires right like oh we're losing i think maybe in peter Thiel, we're losing all the greatest minds that we have available at the moment they're trying to they're, in, they're at a race to make the next angry birds as opposed to solving you know uh societal or environmental or world issues which is very very true even nowadays now we've got people just starting wanting to make the uber of whatever instead of actually focusing on issues that people are uh, actually impacting people for the most part and not just trying to work out another way to get food to people quicker it's just like we had enough um even Mark Beinhoff, CEO of Salesforce, a San Francisco native who has long urged the com- community between the techies and the city, has taken to call in his hometown a train wreck. For Zoe, the newfound financial security from working in tech does not counterbalance her constant a constant sense of being unsafe in the city. She is starving. Uh, she was a starving artist, but she says she's terrified to walk at night. She no longer rides scooters and says the feels triggered when she sees them around the city. She takes Ubers everywhere after dark and asks drivers to watch to make sure she gets inside her building. Mama mia imagine what fucking hell so essentially homeless people in san francisco have become zombies right they're essentially scaring all the natives or the people that are you know essentially propping the city up or allowing the city to still thrive so the techies cause the rise in rent right prices because they all kind of flooded the market and like any real estate agent out there that knows you know that's worth their corn they're going to try and juice them for as much as they can <coughs> there's a limited amount of space planning permissions hard to come by so they can't build more apartments to house these new tech startups so they have to occupy buildings that already exist so that raises the price of them because there's more competition for tenancy that then drives out homelessness because you know there are no squats or abandoned bills to stay in or wherever it may be or shelters they don't there's no space for them to be so where else are they going to go on the streets it's a nice climate they're not going to go anywhere else because it's colder they can hide underneath bridges and railways which most of the places have so essentially tech startups have techies or startups in general have caused this issue themselves haven't they right they've actually caused this issue they've got into a position now where they were quote unquote coming in to save it and now they're cowering away in their ubers uh hiding um at the back seat hoping to get home on time or hoping to get home without anyone jumping in front of them with a dog in hand mark zuckerberg lives nearby but our corner um is the main prostitution corner of the city says a miss uh said one of the Missionary district apartment she shares with her boyfriend uh this con de- this con there's condoms and syringes it's absolutely crazy with how much we pay rent it's tough because we work in tech but we have to sell every day if we should move <laughs> it reminds it sounds like it sounds like the heyday of new york right you know when everyone talks about studio 54 and how crazy it was and if you watch the, the deuce right that's a good example of just like a good representation maybe of how amazing and interesting it must have been right watching old documentaries of you know the factory and andy warhol and all those kind of era like the energy basket like it just it seemed keep hearing like oh my god it was so dangerous and so um crazy that it kind of spawned this reaction from the artist right because they were living in such um hazardous com- uh, environments where any day given day they could get stabbed they could get robbed they could get chased down the street that energy was kind of feeding into their frenzied nature of the artwork that they were producing so it's no coincidence that you know some of the some of the you know um that basket was able to produce such frenzied amount of artwork living in that city with that kind of energy it was just kind of the vibrations of the train tracks were essentially spread across the canvas that he was painting but this is san francisco Right? this is like made up of like coffee shops and guys with like shitty tattoos on purpose and colorful hair and walk around with bare feet and probably not there or with sandals and shit and you know this is this is meant to be chilled and relaxed and you know foosball and hacky sack and all that sort of shit and now look it's insane but they're but they're not paying new york rent or back in the day like you know when you hear uh patty smith right having paying like 120 dollars a month for rent it's not that it's definitely not that um uh, that hearing was, uh, da, da, da. but yeah, it continues on. It's a very thought-provoking st- story. I recommend you check it out. Uh, they've got a bus here that takes Google employees to their uh, actual headquarters again, which is interesting to say the least. Just again, really interesting article, and again, because it shows the unintended. I've, I've, every time, every every time I've seen every I've seen this often. Um, this phrase uttered, and it's always kind of intrigued me ever since I've kind of heard it 
it's been introduced to my lexicon, you know, um, the law of unint- um, the consequence, the law of unintended consequences, right? Um, the fact that you could do one thing thinking it's a good idea, and then it could have unintended consequences that you never foresaw or you could never foresee, um, and this is part of it, right? You build this utopia, and then all of a sudden, look what it turns into. Look what it turns into, and then you look at homeless man in a, in a, in a window. Like that is really weird, isn't it? You've got this guy here on the outside who's homeless and, you know, begging and humbling himself in order to ask for help from his community in order to kind of, you know, live another day. And then you've got people on the inside who are, I don't know how much they're paying per drinks, how much ahead it is, how much the bill's going to be, the average medium spend is, but it's probably high, how much people's outfits are. It's just insane, the contrast, man. That is an insane, insanely good picture in all the wrong, for all the wrong reasons. But yeah, I recommend you check it out. A really cool article um, from The Guardian. Uh, it's, it's titled, We All Suffer, Why San Francisco Techies Hate the City They Transformed. I'll link in the show notes you guys to check out. Uh, written by a one Julia Carey Wong. Great, great article. Really recommend you check it out. Um, next on the list here, route through these other ones so you can leave uber dine in interesting one right um i guess the restaurants had reason to be worried you remember there was a time when restaurants were worried that uber was going to take away from their business because they were doing uber eats and uber was like no don't worry we're just concentrating on um accessing or being able to open up these restaurants that people couldn't get to sometimes day in day out to people you know in your community essentially right we're not going to open physical stores don't worry don't worry don't worry now look uh, or we're not going to step into your territory now look right this is a headline from um, TechCrunch um, I'll get this up on the screen here now um, Uber Eats invades uh, restaurants with dine-in option so it says the following uh, tired of cleaning up after takeout or getting uh, hangry which again is something that I abhor I've got a couple people in my office now at the moment that are consistently hangry when they when their dinner time passes the allotted time that they usually meant to have it. it's just such a frustratingly infantile way to kind of you know um, go about things in life in general like who does that who gets angry because they're not eating it's like grow up man like we eat too much anyway as human beings right we have an, uh, we're overindulgent um, we overindulge ourselves. We're consistently stuffing our faces with fucking food. Take a break. Anyway, let's continue reading this. Uh, tired of clearing up after a takeout or getting hangry waiting at your table in a restaurant while well, Uber Eats is uh, barging into the dining business. A new option in some cities lets you order your food ahead of time, go to restaurants, and then sit down inside to eat. Madness. A tipster from... Uh, from competing dining app Ailset tells us we tested it and Uber Eats dining even waves the standard Uber delivery and service fees. That's a that's pretty cool though, right? So the new option allows you to order the food ahead of time, go to the restaurant and then sit down inside to eat. So I guess for restaurants that are like you know hip or the ones that have a long waiting list, I can't think of a couple. Maybe like Pity Q or because it Klein that in that kind of like sub is it Indonesian restaurants that like clean Klein in, in 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 central London that's always kind of busy there's a few of them anywhere around that are the most hipster places to go to I guess that was where it will serve its purpose adding dine-in adding dine-in lets Uber Eats insert itself into more food transactions expand it to restaurants that care about presentation and don't do delivery and avoid paying drivers while earning low overhead revenue Uber's dining option is now available in some cities, including Austin, Dallas, Phoenix, and San Diego. Of course, these are all the homes of some of the best food trucks that have now trans um, have now kind of uh, translated over into walking restaurants, like that place that does the ribs on the Chef Show. They were a, a food truck, sort of like you know barbecue thing, and now they've got like an actual restaurant that has queues for you know days, and people ring up all the time trying to queue up. I think they disconnected the phone recently, right? But people queue up for days to kind of get into that restaurant. I forgot what it's called, but it's the last couple of episodes of the of the Chef Show. Um, so they would probably benefit from this too, where it could save diners time and fees while helping restaurants to fill empty tables and waiters and tips, right? Again, which is very true, but also could coerce more restaurants to play ball with Uber Eats if their competitors, competitors do eating into their margins. That is great. A dining option. Rate. That's really, really cool. Um, Uber confirmed the existence of dining option, telling me we're always thinking about new ways to enhance the eating experience. Um, they also verify there are no delivery or service fees and restaurants get 100% of tips left in in-app by users. Amazing. However, we found some items were silently marked up from restaurants listed prices in both ubis i guess but that's fine though if they're gonna mark it up don't complain what do you expect you know what i mean like some operational costs that need to be made there if you're gonna yeah i'm, I'm all right there i'm all right for 
going to a burger place that's really hip or really that or like the one to go to because they have you know the best meat or ever maybe or they make you know the best homemade buns i'm down to pay a little bit extra so i can have a seat at the table as opposed to like standing like a dullard waiting for someone to finish their food that's always so awkward in restaurants right especially hip restaurants especially the ones that are like you know all on the on all the blogs like waiting around for someone to finish their meal because number one when you're the person in the seat it's annoying having all people standing up looking at you giving you the evil eye right staring to your skull you can't really enjoy your meal and for the person standing up if 10 minutes feels like an eternity right so the ability to just kind of cut all that shit and just you know wait uh, it kind of shit just order it ahead of time and have a, a kind of slot kind of dialed in for you or maybe they have like a particular window during a day where you can fill those seats is pretty cool i think um however we found that the, the, anyway uber has been rapidly experimenting with uber eats trying discounted specials uber eats pool where you pay less for slower delivery i like that and and a 999 unlimited delivery subscription is steadily becoming an, an omnivore uh, i'd pay that actually a 999 monthly delivery uh subscription i'd pay that in a heartbeat 100 percent i'll pay that one million percent i'd rather pay that and then tip my driver like just because i always thought that would be a good idea right having like a jar at home especially for londoners because we don't really tip people having a coin jar and just filling it with coins and then when someone want, when you want to pop out to tesco's and buy something you want to go get a rizzlers or you want to get get some rolling papers or uh, some rolls or whatever maybe or lighter or some filters or you want to buy a juice you've got a jar that you can just like take a couple of pound coins from and buy because i don't really think you should always be spending that kind of money on with your card or contact us. It's not a really good way to budget. But if you get a little jar next to your where you put your keys and shit, you can just kind of like, you know, um, tip your drivers that way. So whenever someone comes in, just pick up a couple of quid and give it to them. I feel that'd be pretty cool to do. You'll then be notified as the order is prepared. So how it works? Dining appears next to the delivery and pickup options across the top of the Uber Eats app in Sex Cities. You order from the menu and can choose to get ASAP. In some cases, schedule when you want to arrive. You'll be shown how long the food will take to prep, distance to the restaurants, your price and restaurants rating. You'll then be notified as the order is prepared and approaches readiness. Then you just deliver yourself to the restaurant and the food is ready for you to be served. So you essentially you're the courier um you can add a tip in the uh, in app or on the table uber eats should obviously make it easy for you to hail an uber with the restaurant as a preset destination an uber spokesman called that and a good idea but not something is, is doing yet back to 2016 uber tried a merchant sponsored ride option where you'd be get a rebate on your travel if you spent money like oh come on that's a bit too much that's awesome though the new feature could spell trouble for other dining apps like all seat that's been in the business for four years <laughs> yeah, i like how these big just come up and just gobble your stuff right wherever your in your usp is right your unique selling point they just come up you say what well, you got that okay cool copy it and just make it better all right it's just fucking nuts how they do it's so brutal the um this new feature could spell trouble for other dining apps like all set like all set that's uh been in the business for four years users might also opt for uber eats dining over restaurant reservations like apps like open table and resi open table is a bit shit though isn't it um resi i haven't used why waste time waiting for to order for your food to be cooked when you could just show up as it comes out of the oven i think that more why don't they do that though open table they should probably do that though have that as an option um i uh anyway the all seat ceo said the following i think that more delivery players will be tapping into the dining space it's all about convenience and time saving but it's going to be very difficult to be for them given their focus on delivery not really though is it i think he's just trying to be he's trying to be optimistic he believes dedicated apps for different modes of dining will succeed but uber is ubiquity and it's one-stop shop model for all your dining needs she could be stickier than um dining but again the uber eats option is really good have you ever ordered uber eats when you're out and, out and about with friends i did it once when i was in the gym i was just coming out of the gym i think i've got where i was i, I went to a park to go sit down but i went to eat i just went to a park sat down ordered some salad and got it delivered to me to at a park gates met the driver up there and kept my food and sat in the, in the thing and just ate people do it all the time especially if you go inside the city center or where or where i'm based around shoreditch liverpool street there's always somebody ordering a, a delivery or an uber eats to a park for them to sit down and have lunch with it just happens all the time you can even schedule it too if you want to so um again convenience is always going to trump people just want to save time man like if, if anyone can save them time they'll take it right you are going to take it because no one really likes queuing up for a burger right no one even if it's a cool place you just want to go there because it's cool but if you can avoid the queues and you can avoid queuing up for ages, especially for an hour or so, why not do it? Um, this is going to spread. This is a perfect, great option. Again, this goes to show just how genius some of these startups can be when they want to be, man. That's a fucking genius idea. Uber dine in. Wow, 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 wow. So, yeah. Um, 
Uber dining option. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. That's an hour, isn't it? We're about an hour already. That's amazing. I'm happy that this happened. Um, made another podcast. Wowie to me. Thank you for those of you that have tuned in. As per usual, for more information regarding myself, please visit my website, Um, I have a couple of DJ gigs coming up this weekend at the Heathcote Star. So check me out if you want to come to that. You should be able to find a link on my uh, webpage as well. As I mentioned, accidentalzinger.com. If you're watching via YouTube, give me a comment, give me a like and subscribe. If you if there's anything that I've spoken about that you find interesting, let me know so we can carry on that conversation. Um, and also, if you're listening via the podcast app, five star review, man, five star review. I've seen a couple on there as well already. So thanks to whoever left them. That was very much appreciated. Um, that's going to help more people find the show as, you know, these algorithms are weird, right? They need other people to. Algorithms are weird because it, it requires other people to say they like what it requires other people to say they like a certain thing for people to find it right that's how virality works you won't find something unless other people also find it interesting which then goes back to it kind of makes you question just how cool or ahead of the curve you really are but hey that's a story for another day until then thank you very much for listening i'll see you again guys again very very soon that's the end of the action zinger show another show probably again next week no, no probably never another one on the weekend but hey you never know things might change but until then take care and be safe and i'll see you guys another time bye